Right, welcome to this video on the general properties of proteins. So a protein is a polymer, um, and that must mean that it's made up of a long chain of monomers. And the monomers in a protein are amino acids. There's lots of different parts of this amino acid that you need to be familiar with. So starting on the left-hand side over here, we have this NH2 group. This is an amine group or an amino group. So NH2 amine group. On the right hand side we have COOH, that is a carboxylic acid group, and then we have a central carbon with one hydrogen bonded to it, and then we have this strange R up here. R means variable group, more on that in a moment. So you need to be able to draw an amino acid, you don't need to be able to draw it to this level of detail, although to be honest I think it might be useful if you could. This is the structure that is in your specification that you need to be able to draw, it's all still there, we still have our NH2, the amine group, we still have our COOH, the carboxylic acid, hydrogen, and then the R up there. So this is the minimum level of detail that you need to be able to draw. Okay, so if we have uh, a protein is uh, made up of many monomers, then we need to be able to bond some of these amino acids together. So this is how it works. You can see we've got two amino acids here, one and two. In this case, the R has actually been replaced with a hydrogen. This is actually uh, examples of amino acids now. So where we have a hydrogen on the top here, this means this is a glycine amino acid. So uh, you don't need to be able to uh, name any of the amino acids, that's just for your reference why we've got an H instead of an R up there. So if we have a look uh, down here then, where we've got our carboxylic acid group on this amino acid, I've highlighted the OH portion of that, and on this amino acid you can see one of the hydrogens from the amine group has also been highlighted. Now that's because when these two react together, this OH H are lost, so we have H2O being lost, that is a water molecule, that must mean that this is a condensation reaction. So where we lose these, that leaves behind a bond between this carbon and this nitrogen, just down here, and this bond is known as a peptide bond. Okay, so we have a condensation reaction, leaving behind a peptide bond. You don't need to be able to draw this, but you do need to be able to state that it's a condensation reaction and that a peptide bond is formed. Right, a little bit more on these R groups then. So uh, what I'm showing here is all of the 20 different types of amino acids that are found naturally within organisms. You do not need to be able to name any of these amino acids, you do not need to know any of the R groups on them, but it is useful to know the different properties of some of the R groups. So here we have some of the R groups, these are uncharged R groups, these are non-polar R groups, and then all of the remaining have uh, some form of charge associated with them. So these R groups down here are polar, that means that they have partial charges to them. And then we have um, some ionic R groups as well. So these are positively charged R groups, and then these are negatively charged R groups. Now, all of this becomes important when we look at the um, structure of a protein, and particularly the tertiary structure of a protein. So let's have a look at these structures in a bit more detail. So you need to be able to refer to the structure of a protein in terms of its primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure. What is this actually referring to? Well, all we're doing is we're studying the protein in slightly different ways. If we are simply looking at the sequence of amino acids found within the protein, then we are studying the primary structure. So each of these little specks here, this represents a different amino acid. And if we're looking at the different amino acids in what sequence they are in, then this is known as studying the primary structure of the protein. Now, if we uh, have a look at different portions of this primary structure, we might find that some of the amino acids are bonding together through hydrogen bonds. So that's represented here by this uh, region of blue amino acids and this region of blue amino acids here. Now, where we study these hydrogen bonds between the amino acids, this is known as studying the secondary structure. And there's two types of secondary structure that can form. A beta pleated sheet, this is where the um, chain folds back on itself here. So there's hydrogen bonds now forming between the amino acids here, and that's shown just here. And also we can form an alpha helix. So the 
the chain just forms a, a bit of a helical structure. Uh, so I suppose it's a little bit like what forms in DNA, although we only have a single helix here rather than double helix in DNA. And you can see here, this is where the chain has wound round and there's hydrogen bonds keeping this structure in place. So if we're looking at these, uh, this type of uh, structure within the protein, this hydrogen bonding, then this is known as studying the secondary structure. Now the tertiary structure is the one that you need to know in the most detail. The tertiary structure is where the R groups within the amino acids start reacting with each other and start forming bonds with one another. Now there's three types of bond you need to be familiar with that form the tertiary structure. The first type of bond is a hydrogen bond. So this is where one R group on one amino acid will form a hydrogen bond with the R group on another amino acid. This is different to the secondary structure because the secondary structure does not involve the R groups but the hydrogen bonding here within the tertiary structure does involve the R groups. The second type of bond is known as a dull disulfide bridge or a disulfide covalent bond. Uh, it's referred to as disulfide because it involves the R groups of two amino acids that contain sulfur in them. So where the uh, sulfur is found within these R groups, they can actually react together and form a covalent bond between them, uh, and this is known as a disulfide bridge. The third type of bond is an ionic bond. So we saw on the previous slide that there are uh, two types of ionic R groups. There's positively charged R groups and negatively charged R groups. So they have either lost or gained electrons respectively. And if that happens, then an ionic bond can form between them where positive attracts negative and negative attracts positive. Uh, now, the, the bonding that we have here, these are all different strengths of bonds. So the, by far the strongest is this disulfide bridge, the covalent bond. Uh, coming in a close second is the ionic bond, and then the weakest of all is the hydrogen bonds. Now, why is this important? Well, the tertiary structure uh, is very important when we're forming uh, complex proteins uh, and in particular globular proteins. So uh, examples of globular proteins would be enzymes, would be um, antibodies, would be channel proteins, carrier proteins, that sort of thing. They form a sort of 3D structure and that 3D structure is held in place by this internal bonding within the molecule. So any disruption to this bonding is going to change the tertiary structure of the protein and is therefore going to change the function of the protein. If we take an enzyme as an example, if the enzyme is folded in a particular way to form um, an active site, if any of this internal bonding, this intramolecular bonding uh, changes, so if either the bonds are broken or if different bonds form, then the shape of the active site is going to change and so the function of the enzyme is going to change. Either it's going to lose its function or it's going to change its function. Okay, so the tertiary structure then is very, very important. Finally, we could study the quaternary structure of a protein. So up to this point, where we've had a long chain of amino acids, we actually only refer to this as a polypeptide. So many amino acids bonded together is a polypeptide. Uh, the quaternary structure of a protein refers to when we have more than one polypeptide involved. So examples of this would include haemoglobin, where four polypeptides are all bonded together to form one molecule of haemoglobin. So each of the chains of amino acids is referred to as a polypeptide, whereas the haemoglobin itself is referred to as the protein haemoglobin. So the quaternary structure uh, is wherever we have more than one polypeptide bonded together. Now I've seen questions in exams asking you to define all of these uh, previously and in particular they like you to define the quaternary structure of a protein so that is where you have more than one polypeptide uh, bonded together to form the protein. Now I've spoken already about globular proteins so that is where you have uh, a 3D structure to the protein and that's because of this internal intramolecular bonding uh, in the tertiary structure. So I've given you some examples of those as well. The second type of protein is a fibrous protein. And you, you um, obviously you have the primary structure of the protein because you need a chain of amino acids to form the polypeptide. There might be some secondary structure involved as well, although that isn't necessary. Um, 
in the second type of protein, which is known as a fibrous protein. So a fibrous protein is just a long chain of amino acids. Fibrous proteins uh, are very, very important as well. You find fibrous proteins um, making up the cytoskeleton uh, within a cell, so that basically keeps the structure of the cell. You find fibrous proteins uh, in uh, the process of mitosis, so the spindle fibers in mitosis are fibrous proteins, and also in muscles. So actin um, is one of the uh, fibers involved in muscle contraction, and that is a fibrous protein. So fibrous proteins just uh, more simple structure to globular proteins, normally just a long chain of amino acids. Globular proteins uh, have a complex tertiary structure giving them their function. Okay, last up then is the biochemical test for proteins. So the biochemical, te biochemical test is the biuret test. So biuret solution is blue, so a negative test for uh, proteins would be that this solution remains blue. But if you add your sample to the biuret solution, you don't need to do anything to it other than stir it or shake it. And if it turns lilac, then that tells you there is protein present. In particular, the biuret test tests for peptide bonds, so the lilac colour tells you that there is a peptide bond present and therefore there is a protein present. Okay, here are the key terms for this topic, so pause now if you want to take note of those. Loads more free resources on my website pxsbiology.com and if you found this video useful then please like, subscribe or share.